you know, in the United States, we had two really important uh, bills passed in the last two years, the first being the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, which was a $1.2 trillion bill uh, to basically reinvest in U.S. infrastructure. Um, and then we had the Inflation Reduction Act, which brought another, you know, $350 billion or so into, uh, into clean energy and electric vehicles. So, uh, and then actually there's a third one, I'll give you a bonus one, which is the Chips and Science Act, which is bringing another few hundred billion dollars into semiconductors in the United States. So these are really powerful bills, billions and billions uh, of dollars uh, in the United States. And they're intended to, uh, first of all, be long-term. Uh, the, the, all this money will not be spent tomorrow. These you know, dollars could be spent over the next five to 10 years, but they're really designed to achieve a specific policy. They look at a specific problem in the United States, our infrastructure is old, or infrastructure hasn't kept pace with population growth or changing preferences of how people use the infrastructure. So throw a bunch of money at it. Similarly, uh, you know, significant government interest in developing manufacturing capacity in the United States in fast growing sectors like clean energy or like electric vehicles or semiconductors, putting a lot of money towards those use cases. So there's a lot of money out there that is now authorized for the U.S. government to spend. And we're going to start to see a lot of it being dispersed as soon as this year. So there's already over $100 billion from the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, uh, which has been earmarked for spending this year. Um, so this provides significant tailwinds to the companies that are effectively those government contractors, the companies that will benefit from those dollars being spent either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the infrastructure space, for example, uh, you know, we look at companies like um, infrastructure enablers, which would be construction and engineering companies that are building the next generation of infrastructure in the United States. Uh, we would also look at infrastructure operators, the companies that operate infrastructure today and may be benefiting some, from some of those government dollars coming out. So there's you know, interesting segments within, uh, within the economy that are really going to you know be the receivers of these dollars coming from the government mm -hmm. so just on the um electric vehicles point of view so the, the prices are improving and it's being helped by government support in that area and um, what are the key hurdles that electric vehicles still need to overcome to fast track the adoption in society i mean there's still these problems they have with um i think in the cold you know it's sort of halves or, or even more than that, the uh, the capacity of the, of the the batteries, uh, and also there's this mileage thing that you know I think we've reached a pretty big hurdle recently. You're getting sort of actually I don't know what it is in kilometers, something 500 kilometers, something off of a full charge. Is it something like this? Um, but still, you get people get these uh, anxiety. I think they've got, they've got a term for it. Um, range anxiety. Yeah, uh, range anxiety. So you know people don't know when they can fill up. They're worried someone's. Uh, you know, going to be taking some of the stations when, when they get there. So, that, you know, there's problems still related to petrol uh, vehicles or gas. Yeah. What's your thoughts on you that? Know, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, a. Uh... In some ways, it's it's an incredible task to completely change how uh, at least passenger vehicles operate in the United States, moving from one very tried and true platform to a completely different one. Um, but the progress has been astounding. Um, you know, electric vehicles over the last few years have really moved from kind of a niche uh, innovator or early adopter product to achieving much more mass market appeal. Um, you're totally right. I mean, a lot of that is driven by price. So uh, you look at some of the falling costs in the electric vehicle space, uh, you look at some of the tax subsidies related to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, all of that has served to bring down the off-the-lot cost of buying an electric vehicle. So there are now electric vehicles that, uh, you know, after tax credits uh, can be less than $30,000 in the United States. And there's several more that are less than $40,000 right now. So if you just think about that from the perspective of the average cost uh, or the average purchase price of a vehicle in December in the United States across all vehicles was about $50,000. You can see that that $30,000 price point, that $40,000 price point means that electric vehicles have already made it more towards the mass market. Yeah. Um, but you're right. That's not the end all be all. You know, it's not just about uh, having a cheaper uh, price off the lot. It's about accessibility to charging. Uh, people don't really worry about finding a gas station. The density of chargers in the United States is is, is not close to that. Um, but that's where the inflation, uh, sorry, the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act comes in, which is designed to 10x the number of chargers in the United States uh, over the life of that bill. So when that comes into play, that addresses a lot of the range anxiety. Um, I think the third pillar, though, is is technology itself. Um, you know, uh, you're mentioning uh, electric vehicles don't perform as well in the cold. Um, not to get too nerdy on this, but there's different types of batteries that 
have different types of performances. So, um, you know, you may think of like uh, the 93 octane uh, unleaded gas. It's kind of the highest performance gasoline. You know, if you're fueling up a sports car, you'll fuel it up with the 93 octane. The equivalent to that is an NMC battery, which is nickel, manganese, and cobalt. A lot of electric vehicles run on NMC battery uh, chemistry these days. Um, the downside of that high performance, though, is cold weather. Cold weather can impact the range of those batteries. Now, if you think about diesel, you know, diesel fuel can run through anything. It's tried and true. You know, it can run the most powerful trucks, ships, uh, cars. It just, it's not the highest performance, but it is a, uh, you know, just a, a machine, for lack of a better word, at turning on and, and operating. Um, the battery equivalent to that is an iron phosphate battery. Um, it's a little bit of an older technology, but it is not as impacted by the cold. Uh, it can go through a lot more charge cycles. It's just a much more robust battery platform. So interestingly, as you see more cars coming out and you see battery technology advance, you're actually seeing iron phosphate becoming a, a more popular battery design going forward to address some of those issues. So the technology is is absolutely advancing. And then the fourth pillar here for electric vehicle adoption are supply chains. Um, you know, a lot of electric vehicles you can't get your hands on right now. Uh, they're simply backordered for months, if not even years, for some of the most popular models. So supply chains are not built overnight, um, but a lot of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act are all going to kind of grease the wheels of that supply chain uh, to ensure that there is more capacity to sell electric vehicles to this rising consumer demand. So you put all that together, I really think we're at an inflection point for electric vehicles.